So it's 10 a.m. in Japan, so we'd like to start our um, webinar. Hello and everyone, and welcome to this first session of the live webinar um, series, A Carbon Neutral Society Action Month, hosted by Kyushu University in cooperation with APRU. I'm Natalie Konomer, Konomi, Professor and Manager of the Global Strategies Office at Kyushu University, and I will be your moderator today. So before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar will be recorded. And if everyone agrees, we would also like to temporarily upload the recordings on the APRU website. Thank you for your understanding. Um, as you may already um, be aware, um, this event is a regular Zoom meeting, which is less anonymous than a webinar. And therefore, if your surroundings permit, please turn on your cameras throughout the event, especially during the discussion time, but keep your microphones off. And please rename your screen name um, to your name and university name if you haven't done so already. Thank you very much. So I would also like to invite everyone to ask questions during the Q&A session. We are very eager to hear from you. Now, if you have questions during the presentation time itself, you may either post the questions in the chat and I will address them during the Q&A session. Or again, you can ask them during the Q&A session directly by yourself. Um, but make sure please don't turn on your microphones unless um, you're instructed to do so. Okay, enough talking from my side. I would now like to invite Professor Toshiyuki Kono, Executive Vice President of Kyushu University to give his opening remarks. Professor Kono, please. Thank you very much. Distinguished participants, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all and to address you on such a precious occasion of hosting the APRU Carbon Neutral Society Action Month live webinar series. This is a vitally important topic, and I am thrilled to see so many participants from around the globe present at this event. First of all, I would like to thank you all for attending today's kickoff event of this webinar series. Over the course of the next five weeks, you will have the opportunity to join five webinar sessions to hear about a variety of decarbonization related themes, highlighting a range of research initiatives conducted by APRU universities and non-APRU non members. In addition, we will have the chance to contribute discussions that seek to identify strategies and possible solutions for preserving the global environment and achieving a sustainable society, beginning with today's introduction session and continuing through the final webinar on June 10th. Taking a look at the registration numbers, I'm very pleased that around 700 individuals have registered for this complete webinar series, with an average of 140 people having signed up for each session. Of these, the number of participants in the interactive activity sessions for early career researchers in each webinar are over 80 people, including 49 early career researcher nominations from APRU member universities. I'd like to thank all APRU member universities for their cooperation in nominating early care researchers from their institutions. Discussions during this webinar series will focus on the realization of a decarbonized society as a means of combating climate change and establishing a sustainable society by bringing together you, a diverse international group of experts and researchers from a variety of research fields in order to facilitate the exchange of ideas, discussion of potential cross-disciplinary approaches, and the collaborative development of solutions. I would also like to point out that to continue building an international network with an emphasis on a carbon neutral society, this webinar series serves as a pilot for a long-term program for early career researchers devoted to various aspects of global environmental preservation and the realization of a sustainable decarbonized society. Therefore, we are very much looking forward 
to any feedback you may provide. I would also like to convey my appreciation to today's keynote speakers. It is a great honor to have Mr. Shigeru, Shigeru Aoyagi, Director of UNESCO Asia Pacific Region Bureau, Regional Bureau for Education, UNESCO Bangkok, and Professor Shunsuke Managi, Distinguished Professor and Director of the Urban Institute from Kyushu University. In addition to today's lectures, there'll be an interactive online network session for Arikara researchers. Last but not least, I would like to express my profound gratitude to the APRU Secretariat for their dedicated support and contribution to help organize this wonderful event. Today, we are delighted to welcome Ms. Christina Maria Schoenleber, Senior Director of Policy Research Programs at APRU. Thank you for your kind and continued support. In closing, I'm confident that this webinar series will be an enriching experience for all of us, opening doors to new collaborations. I hope that everyone will enjoy the program and I wish you a very successful conference with the library discussions among the participants. I'm looking forward to seeing new collaborations and strong relationships through this webinar series. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you very much, Professor Kono. I would now like to invite Ms. Christina Schoenleber as introduced Senior Director of the Policy and Research Programs at APRU to give her opening remarks. Christina, please. Okay, thank you again, Natalie and Vice President Kono for the very nice introduction. Um, I'm Christina Schoenleber from the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. I'm based here in Hong Kong. And on behalf of APRU, I would also like to welcome all our distinguished keynote speakers and all participants to this inaugural session and introductory lecture kickoff for the Carbon Neutral Society Action Month. And upfront, I specifically also would like to thank the colleagues from Kyushu University, which is Vice President Kono and Professor Konomi for their incredible leadership in developing this five week program, acting as a platform to bring together a regional network of international multidisciplinary experts to advance this incredible important discussions and actions towards a carbon neutral society. So I'll just give you a really brief overview of APU since many of you may have not heard about our association yet. So the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, or in short APU, is a network of 60 leading research universities based along the Pacific Rim, as it is well presented on this slide that you can see just now. So all the black dots are our universities. And our member universities and their scientists and colleagues are from 19 economies uh, or countries from this region. And Kyushu University is one of our very valued members from Japan. And it is really fantastic to know that we have speakers and participants engaging over the next five weeks from our members based in Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, and the West Coast of Canada, the US and Latin America, as well as other distinguished experts on this topic. So the AP network was established close on about 25 years ago with the aim for universities and scientists to collaborate collectively with external stakeholders from governments, industry, and multilateral organizations to very specifically support the development of the Asia Pacific region. Now, this is still our key objective today, but I have to say that the priorities over the last 25 years have changed and the focus of our impact collaborations is now different. Now we want to address most pressing challenges and IPU brings together scientists with our external partners on to address areas and collaborations and issues in uh, the areas of sustainability, environmental and societal challenges. Now advancing the discussion on climate change and supporting the development of solutions on climate change issues is one of APU's key priority areas now. And as such, it is really fantastic that this specific action months addressing one of the fundamental environmental challenges humankind is facing is taking place now. 
My findings from scientists of the third IPCC working group were released this April, just a month or so ago, calling for major transitions in the energy sector, considerable reduction in fossil fuel use and widely improved energy efficiency. It will also require the development and implementation of alternative fuels and technologies to generate electricity while industry will need to rethink and change production processes and strive towards achieving full circularity. And in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, the global community will have to ensure that greenhouse gas emissions peak before 2025 and emissions are reduced by 23% by 2030. So this gives all of us less than three and seven years respectively to take action and becoming a global carbon neutral society is a key necessity to reach net zero carbon emissions and to, to achieve this important goal within the little time that we have left. To this regard, I'm very much looking forward over the next five weeks to the discussions and exchanges on the, this latest develop on the latest developments for low carbon decarbonization negative emissions technologies new energy models and transport systems as, as well as the important role and opportunities for cities and urban centers that are key drivers for carbon neutral societies and also the need for policies and government frameworks to be in line to support this transition while societies and individuals need to be brought fully on board to tackle this greatest of challenges we are all facing. So again, to this regard, I really want to thank all the college and um, colleagues from Kyushu University who have conceived the idea of this program and tirelessly worked to make this reality. And I want to thank all the speakers and all the participants who have joined us for this important program and really look forward to five weeks of engaging and impactful discussions. So I'm looking forward to the first session today. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored to introduce our first keynote speaker today, Mr. Shigeru Aoyagi. Mr. Aoyagi is currently the Director of Asia and Pacific Regional Bureau for Education and UNESCO which is based in Bangkok, Thailand. And he started his career in UNESCO as chief of non-formal education in Paris in 2002 and moved to Afghanistan as a director of UNESCO Kabul and representative to Afghanistan in 2006, then to India in 2012 to assume office of UNESCO New Delhi as representative to India, Bhutan, Maldives, and Sri Lanka. Mr. Aoyagi will speak on the topic of the role of education to creating a carbon neutral society focusing on the Sustainable Development Goals 4 and 13, critical goals for achieving the 2030 Agenda. So Mr. Aoyagi, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Professor Kono, Dr. Schindler, uh, Professor Managi, dear participants of the webinar. Very good morning from Bangkok. <clears throat> It is my great pleasure to join you today and speak about the role of education in creating a carbon neutral society. <clears throat> Let me first congratulate Kyushu University and APLU on the organization of this very timely webinar series. I see this initiative as highly relevant for the following reasons. First, this initiative builds on the momentum of the COP 26 in Glasgow last November. Second, as we take concrete steps towards a carbon neutral society, it is vital to bring together stakeholders and researchers from diverse fields to raise public awareness and explore implications for education and training. Third, as we rethink and reimagine the purpose, content, and delivery of education, in other words, to transform education towards peaceful, inclusive, and sustainable futures of humanity and the planet. It is really important for us to look into how education can play a key role in creating carbon neutral society. Well, the, in my keynote, I will reflect on education and carbon neutral societies in five parts. First, we will look into updates on the SDGs progress in Asia and the Pacific, especially SDG 
4 and SDG 13. Second, that we will look and review United Nations and UNESCO's frameworks and initiatives in support of carbon neutral societies. Third, I will focus on UNESCO's programs to accelerate transformations towards a resilient and decarbonized society. Fourth, we will see some findings from the country submissions to UNFCCC. And finally, I will touch upon some conclusions for the way forward. Uh, the SDG progress report for Asia and the Pacific, which was published last March by UNSCAP, illustrates how much progress has been made in our region to achieve the 17 SDGs. According to the report, the estimated year to achieve the SDGs in our region at current pace is 2065. Progress towards the SDGs in the region has slowed as the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change have exacerbated development challenges. <clears throat> At the current rate of change, none of the 17 SDGs will be achieved in the region, except that only East and Northeast Asia is on track towards no poverty of goal one and industry innovation and infrastructures of goal nine. This graph shows where the Asia Pacific region stands on the 17 SDGs. Although there is progress on goals pertaining to industry, energy, poverty, and health, there has been little or no progress in areas of education, gender, clean water, decent work, sustainable cities, and life below water. Notably, the region has regressed on SDG 13 on climate action. Uh, all in all, the region is not on track to achieve most of the measurable targets by 2030. Achieving these targets requires urgent and rapid acceleration of progress or the reversal of negative trends. In other words, every one of SDGs have fallen off track. Very unfortunately. Well, let's look at SDG 4 on education. Among the 10 targets of SDG 4, SDG 4.7 is the most relevant target that we should look and take a closer look for creating a carbon neutral societies. SDG 4.7 urges that by 2030, all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. Education for Sustainable Development, or ESD, is a means to achieving many of 17 SDGs and the key enabler for SDG 13 on climate action. Global citizenship education are central components of the SDG 4.7 and the discourse is moving towards an integrated approach to achieve SDG 4.7 by bringing them together under the theme of transformative education, an interdisciplinary concept involving teaching and learning geared to motivating and empowering learners to make informed decisions and actions to address ever-changing challenges at individual community, and global levels. Uh, it should be noted once again that SDG 13 is only one goal which showed regression in the region. We need to reverse the trend now. Among the five targets of SDG 13 on climate action, SDG 13.3 has a very strong message for education community which focuses improved education, awareness raising, and human and institutional capacity on climate change mitigation, adaptation, impact reduction, and early warning. Uh, here I come to the part two of my presentation on UN frameworks for climate change education. To address the uh, SDG 13, the UN system has global frameworks for climate change education, 
that contribute towards achieving carbon neutral societies. Let's look at some of them. <clears throat> the Article 6 of the UNFCCC, as well as Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, stress on education, training, public awareness, and access to information related to climate change. Education and training are integral in enabling citizens to become more aware of their role as consumers and make ethically informed decisions. The IT Nagoya Declaration on ESD was adopted at the UNESCO World Conference on ESD held in 2014 in Japan and reaffirms ESD as a vital means to sustainable development. As I previously mentioned, within the Global Education 2030 Agenda, SDG Target 4.7 and SDG Target 13.3 stresses stress the role of education for climate change action. The UNESCO Global Action Program on ESD led to the Berlin Declaration uh, is a milestone to connect SDG 4 and SDG 13 at the global level. UNESCO's call to enhance global commitment to climate education was echoed at COP26 through a day of events with ministers of education and environment, teachers, civil society, and youth. For the first time, ministers of education and environment came together at COP26 to pledge to integrate climate change into their curriculums and mainstream education into climate change policies. The UN and the UNESCO frameworks assert that it is possible for communities to get to or near net zero carbon, but this requires systemic transformation that reflects the complex inter interdependence between learned behaviors, policy, urban infrastructure, and carbon lock-in. Education and training, public awareness and access to information and participatory decision making is essential for us to achieve net zero carbon emission by changing patterns of behavior as well as policies. The UN and UNESCO frameworks offer opportunities to promote education, training, public awareness, public access to information, public participation and international participation to enable carbon neutral societies. UNESCO recognizes education as an untapped opportunity, as well as the role of educators as agents in bringing social changes. Uh, in this part three, let me now share with you some examples of UNESCO's initiatives that could contribute towards climate change actions. For instance, Mega Cities Alliance for Water and Climate Change for, highlights the importance and potential of engaging people and the communities across all sectors towards greater sustainability. Uh, this is significant due to the importance of water for carbon neutral future. The initiative tries to provide an international cooperation forum for dialogue on water to help mega cities adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change. It will involve all stakeholders in water sector, national and local governance leaders, civil society representatives, researchers, urban planners, decision makers, uh, utility operations, and others. <laughs> Now, uh, ESD. In general, education can enable individuals and the communities to make informed decisions and to take responsible action for climate resilient sustainable development that helps build carbon neutral societies. Through formal, non formal, and informal settings, teaching and learning can integrate relevant content on climate change education, risk reduction, and scientific literacy 
that enable carbon neutrality. As we see, ESG is essential to UN's mandate. The UN General Assembly adopted a resolution on UN decade of ESG in December 2005, which recognizes ESG as an integral element of sustainable development. And SDG4 is a key enabler of all sustainable development goals. <coughs> ESD is the foundation for providing everyone with knowledge, skills, values, and attitude to become change agents for sustainable development to fulfill our commitments for the next generation. ESD has been promoted globally with strong intellectual and financial support from Japan. I thank for that for Japan. Uh, at school level, as part of the ESD Global Action Program, UNESCO Associated School Network or ASPNet focused on the implementation of the whole institutional approach to ESD with a particular focus on climate change. The whole school approach to climate change focused on school governance, teaching and learning, community partnerships and facilities and operations. This initiative, initiative piloted in over 250 schools in 25 countries enabled collaborative spaces where the schools can exchange their experiences and practices with each other. Uh, now, in this part four, we will review the analysis and the key findings of country submissions on climate change education to the UNFCCC. Uh, it is important that we take stock of lessons learned from experiences at country level in this area. <clears throat> To name some, climate change education is addressed by almost all countries in the UNFCCC country submissions. Cognitive learning is more commonly discussed in relation to climate change education than social, emotional, or behavioral learning, regardless of education level. Uh, countries tend to report on environmental education rather than ESD. 13% of country submissions included specific climate change responses with a strong focus on adaptation and mitigation over impact reduction or early warning. Uh, these findings highlight achievements and remaining gaps in climate change education. Uh, this graphs on the graphs on this and the following slides are taken from UNESCO document on country progress on climate change education, training and public awareness, which was published in 2019. Here we can see that public awareness was the most common approach in climate change education in each region to be followed by education and training. The three other approaches, access to information, public participation, and international cooperation to climate change education represented 21% of all references in total. Uh, in this slide, the references to formal education in the country submissions were examined for the relative focus on cognitive, social, and emotional and behavioral learning dimensions in relation to climate change education. Cognitive learning was the most common across primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Uh, this brings me to the last part of the presentation to reflect, to reflect together on the way forward. As we saw at the beginning, SDG 4 and SDG 13 are not on track at all. And if we cannot change the trend, we will never see the success. 
we are at the critical turning point. We face a choice if we continue on an unsustainable path or radically change course. We know that education has great power to bring about change. Knowledge and learning are essential for any social transformation. But at present, the, way, the ways we organize education do not do enough to ensure justice, peace, and a healthy planet. The recent UNESCO report on reimagining our futures together calls for a new social contract for education and unites us around collective endeavors and provide the knowledge and innovation needed to shape sustainable and peaceful futures for all. Anchors in social, economic, and environmental justice. Transformative education will be central to achieving this vision. Uh, given the urgency of climate change action to enable carbon neutral societies, we need to work more in terms of determining its full definition, advocating and raising public awareness, mainstreaming in policy and strategy, integrating knowledge and skills for carbon neutral societies in curriculum and learning materials, enhancing teachers' training by empowering teachers to address these issues and identifying indicators to assess progress. In order to complete such a wide scope of works with step-by-step -step consensus building, the engagement of the research community is critically important. The research community, in, including universities, can play a significant and indispensable role in leading the current discourse on carbon neutral societies. This includes the followings. A, universities are hubs of organizational learning, innovation, and research and the development that can support decision makers in formulating strategies for carbon neutral cities with a focus on ESD. B, uh, emerging issues and trends needs to be analyzed for their implications for policy, practice, and pedagogy. C, uh, timely collection, analysis, and utilization of data and the production of evidence by the research community will promote informed decision-making in general, public and educational stakeholders at different levels. <clears throat> and finally, the partnerships and collaborations between schools, universities, business sectors, NGOs, and governments at central and local levels can help address challenges and issues of climate action. Uh, having gone through the SDGs progress in the region and introduced the UN and UNESCO frameworks and programs for climate change and education to reduce the persistent carbon emissions, I would like to suggest in closing four action areas for the university and APRU to be positively engaged in the advancement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with specific focus on carbon neutral societies. Action area one, contribution to the current discourse on carbon neutral societies. It is a responsibility of the universities to act on the research and insights from their faculties and students. It is timely to draw from insights and evidence to advance SDG 4 and SDG 13 to build on the discourse on the carbon neutral societies with available scientific evidence on potential solutions. It is critical that policymakers and regulators focus not only on industrial source of emissions, but on individuals 
as individuals contribute to a large percentage of carbon dioxide emissions. For that, we have to change the mindset of children, youth, and adults through education. Going beyond cognitive learning, there is a need for behavioral learning regardless of education level. Action area two, participation in regional global workshops, meetings and conferences concerning SDG 4.7. For example, UNESCO, UNICEF, and Thai Education Ministry will jointly organize the second Asia Pacific Regional Education Ministers Conference with financial support from mixed Ministry of Education Japan from 5 to 7 June next month. The conference will discuss and make recommendations on how to achieve education recovery and at the same time strengthen and transform education systems to accelerate SDG 4 implementation. Transformative education as an important component of the futures of education that can also address the issue of decarbonization is one of the most important subjects to be discussed over there. I welcome your particip participation in this regional conversation. Action in area three, enhancement of interdisciplinary research and collaboration with academic networks at regional and global levels. Carbon neutrality is an interdisciplinary disciplinary matter as it needs knowledge about energy systems, climate change, economics, policy design, and role of education to name a few. Carbon neutrality being an issue whose solutions lie beyond the scope of one discipline and the universities have a responsibility to take collective action and synthesize disciplines to confront the multifaceted questions pertaining to this decarbonized society by integrating information, data, concepts, tools, and theories to identify potential solutions. And action area four, engage in a dual strategy to reduce carbon footprint and increase carbon rainprint. As universities adopt and promote carbon neutral goals and practices, they may adopt a twin strategy. First, the university reduces its own carbon footprint and aims to become a carbon neutral institution by adopting low carbon operational practices by aiming for net zero emission of institution linked greenhouse gas. Second, universities develop curricula and pedagogical approaches to educate students about the imperatives of carbon neutrality and climate change mitigation and adaptation, thus expand the societal carbon brain footprint. <clears throat> As such, universities educate future educators, environmentalists, auditors, managers, engineers, practitioners, technical professionals, policy makers, and community members about mitigating and adapting to climate change while enabling social and governance measures for carbon neutrality. Well, let me end my talk with a quote from our Director General, Audrey Asre. I quote, <clears throat> education is crucial for climate action because it has the exceptional power to make evolve mindsets and behaviors in the long run. Because education can change minds, it can change the world. Well, the, I thank you for your kind attention and welcome your involvement in UNESCO's forthcoming initiatives to achieve Agenda 2030. I thank you all once again for the opportunity to be with you here today. 
I wish you stimulating and productive discussions in today's webinar. Thank you very much, Mr. Aoyagi, for this very stimulating speech. I've learned a lot already, and um, I'm really looking forward to the questions later from everyone. Um, I would now like to welcome our next and final keynote speaker for today, Professor Shinsuke Managi. Professor Managi is a distinguished professor of technology and policy and director of the Kyushu University Urban Institute. He's a director for the Inclusive Wealth Report, a lead author for the International Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystems system services, and a coordinating lead author on UNESCO International Science and Evidence-Based Education Assessment. Today, Professor Managi will speak on inclusive wealth for SDGs and on how to measure sustainability and well-being. Professor Managi, the floor is yours. I'm going to talk on the, how the academics can contribute to different meaning for the societies not just for the academics, for the publication, but contributing to actual implementation for the SDGs. So we are good about basically finding the new measurement. Also, we are good for making it visual for the well-being's understanding. Then the question comes in how we are judging the future value for the societies in terms of making industry to be more productive, uh, people become happier, then make it cohesive, not just for the one region or one country, but also to the many different countries. Today, I'll be talking on the issue for inclusive wealth. This is a indicator for the inclusive growth. So we understand better for the carbon neutrality, uh, not just saying that we should reduce emissions, but also saying, this is additional value to the society and how wealth can be promoted, how it's important, these can be addressed well. Last year, almost one year ago in the June, we had IPBS, IPCC's joint workshop organized. And we have been talking about not just for the carbon neutrality, but all actual policy implementation need to address that action doesn't have a negative impact to the biodiversity, land use, and others. So this makes it actually more difficult for the society to think about carbon emission reductions, because we need to think about not only for the carbon emission reductions, but also in the same time for preserving the land, thinking about the other well beings. But this is a good step so that Many countries, including the United States, European Union, Japan, and many other countries recognize this importance for thinking about society with sustainability. How we judge that sustainability level is well understood in the academics. When we ask a question, how we are measuring the level for the sustainability? Academics, especially coming from the economics this spring, we say the increase in the inclusive wealth will be the one to judge how sustainability is getting better over the time or not. Here in we, we are talking about carbon neutralities that matter to the carbon issues. Then natural capital matters. Natural capital is a one concept thinking about preserving the forest, promoting better agricultures, not use much on the mineral resources, but also reducing the emissions, which damage the climate. But it shouldn't be the trade-off to have a negative impact to the human capitals, which is people's education value, also the health values. Also the construction activity, which connect to the manufacturing capital matters a lot. So, over the decades from the 1990, we have been measuring this old value for the more than 150 countries for 25 years. Last year, we are successful putting this effort to the United Kingdom as a one example where the Pastor Dasigupta headed this report asked by the government 
and implement that. Natural capital would be the key concept for the United Kingdoms, saying that carbon dioxide need to be reduced, which is part of the natural capital, and nature should be positive in the long run. So facing that, we know the value for the nature has been decreasing for the past 20 years. They set the target, providing the policy to increase the value for the natures, including the reduction for the carbon dioxide. Echo is a work from the United Kingdoms, United States last month, start to say natural capital would be a good account to think about from the United States size. The Secretary for the Commerce, the Gina Raymond, presented last month to say this is a future effort. The policy will be coming and the value estimation is coming. So the carbon dioxide reduction is a value not, not just for the environmental research group or environmental action group or business community. This becomes a policy target for the United States. When we talk about those country levels, where also Japan is involved to promote the natural capitals, people wonder, this is only the issue for developed countries, nothing about developing countries. We say it's not. As a United Nations environmental programs, I headed a report for China, also the India, which are circulated well in the domestic policies, but also to the outside, the Pakistan promoted the increased wealth for Pakistan's, which is disclosed last year in the Global Environmental Day. They also implement the policy as a 10 billion tree tsunami project, where the more trees comes in, they capture the carbon dioxide, not just it looks good for the nature's values. So policy is coming in. This is a great contribution from the academics globally. Also from the MGPP's uh, UNESCO's Mahatma Gandhi Institute for the Education for the Peace and Sustainable Development. We have thinking about this education contribution from sustainabilities. They provided a report reimagining the education as an assessment report based on the science. We provide this idea for the increased wealth as whereas carbon dioxide emission reductions. Natural capitals play the key concept for the sustainabilities. So education experts, also the practice people need to think about those education to think not just for the memorizing and implementing, but inclusive education matters for these sustainabilities. I'm gonna tell the basic concept in two slides for the increased wells. So this is a aggregated measure for the wells, thinking about natural capital values and human capital and physical capitals. Sometimes people talk about what about the cultures? What about the people relationship at social capitals? That is also involved as these measures. This is sufficient index showing the societies in one region or one country or globally, whether it looks good or not. So we need to put the effort as an investment, people's investment to the education, people's investment to reduce emissions, all matter to that. So the SDGs, United Nations Statistical Office need to think about this utilization of these indicators. This is academically well understood from the contribution from Ken Arrows and others who got the Nobel Prize in many different disciplines. So the academic's contribution can change the practice in the global world. United Nations will understand the contribution for the evidence-based policy making. They have produced many statistical tables, also the accounts, of nation's values, carbon's values, also including how it matters to the water and others. So this is a comprehensive indicator to present to the different communities. The good thing about that is we can connect 
to the energy use, not thinking only about the emissions, because people's well being need to be supported by at least from the incomes, and then what type of energy to be used, and then the society will be well off. SDG's goodness is to try to be comprehensive about not thinking only for the climate actions, but the quality of life in general. How land will be developed, how education matters to the next steps for the people's actions, whether the water will be safe or not, then the people's health matters. So the concept for the SDGs number eight for the economic growth need to think about the sustainability for the decent work. This will be the good indicator to think about comprehensively for the SDGs. Our first comings includes the report. One of tells many countries have been developing different index for the physical capitals. Of course, the GDP matters, but more importantly, we need to think about some of them are not successfully increasing only the natural capitals decrease globally and many countries. Human capital have been decreasing in some countries because some country be reducing the populations, reducing the wage and the senior people has been increasing. But mostly the index for the natural capital matters. World Economic Forum stated that most of the GDPs more than half of them coming from the natural capital in the end, decrease in the value for the nature, damage the society in the long run. We have protect different indicator for the human capital, natural capitals, and the physical capitals. We could make it better in the way that not just thinking about the bigger countries, but make it a smaller country be visible so that they can see how it's moving around to the different line with the other country or not. This is a time trend tables saying that global natural capitals has been decreasing over the decades, but as a future green index tells by region by region, this value need to be increased. We see that when the value of the natural capital decrease, in the other sense, we are saying that emission for the carbon need to be reduced. Society's next step inclusive growth will be limited. People can say easily, this need to be changed. But actually, when we are seeing the past trend for the many countries, only physical capitals, only the human capital has been both connected well and the trade-off comes to the burden to the natures, burden to the climate. That's why the only the natural capital has been decreasing. So the future generation gonna have a problem that there are no enough resources, no enough land to make it renewable energy, no enough land to produce ecosystem service. That would be the problem so the society to have a pro potential growth for the societies. Before the conclusion, I want to say one thing about how different disciplinary can contribute each other's. We know by evidence, as I show, many country has been changing their development patterns. Knowledge and the acknowledgement and the intention for the policy has been increased a lot for the climate change. That's why Kyoto Protocol started, Paris Agreement comes in, and overall, many policy implemented, such as emission trading, carbon tax, and support for the carbon free technologies. But we are saying carbon neutrality before 2050s. For example, case, take a case of for Japan, we need to reduce every year 3.1% for the carbons 
but it's not going well. Japan has been start decreasing the carbon emission already, but more than 3% per year will be very tough. IPCC, IPBS, all many academic activities quite start to understand additionally how we can change the policies. The new issues, for example, is forestry carbon observations. So afforestation, the forest management matters. The new plantings can get more carbon dioxide inside. We know this is finding from the many different cases, but what we didn't know from the agricultural expert was even the satellite can contribute for those activities, which mainly come from the physics and the forestry disciplines, now getting back to the economics. This is a region that you see as a map is Kyushu, there our university located, which is south of Japan. We have collaborated well with NASA, also the JAXAs. They provide satellite information. What we do is we understand well how tree grows over the time. What kind of tree is there? How old they are? So we match with different database within a country. So that basically the same technique can apply to the many different countries. We're gonna know for the next 30 years, in particular area by area, how much additional carbon can be observed, which is roughly 10% of the all Kyushu regions for those carbon reductions. Of all Japan's, it's ranged from the five to seven percent of the total Japan's. What is key here is in the poor region, or I should say less developed regions where the more forestry coverage matters, people tend to think this is an area that there's not so much economic activities. But now we show by evidence, more than rural regions, they can plant another forest again by cutting the old one. So we see by pictures, where will be the old one coming in because they don't get much carbon emissions anymore. We start to cut those area by area by area. So we decide to work together with Fukuoka region, Oita region, both are north part of Kyushu and bank finance group come in together and the municipality join together and the consulting com company to come together. So what do we do is we decide where to cut the trees, where to plant new trees. We're gonna have measuring over time by time. Why the industry interested in joining this? Because this will be the next industry activities where we see the progress. We can reduce the emissions and voluntary carbon credit matters in the global market where any countries who want to reduce emissions can purchase that. And those additional money that we can create can go to the different countries, for example, planting for the mangrove and others. So this is an issue not just for the one region or one industry. This is more the issue that creating the market can contribute to the better nature positive also the carbon neutralities. And the most importantly, the industry, including the finance and also the municipality join together. By understanding that, many different disciplinary can contribute for the various promotions. As I show in my former slide, this is an activity initially coming from the physics, coming from the imaging, coming from the forestries and agricultures. So economics came together with those regions. Then industry activity comes in together. In the next generation the academics, I hope, will be more joint work between the different stakeholders. In the past 10 years, we have been saying that 
interdisciplinary is important. We have been saying that stakeholders are important, but the next generations or the young researchers is try to actually reduce emissions. Also, the incentive come together from the municipality because they want to create a new industries. The industrial peoples join too because financially it matters too. Each national company, each national region also good as a good benefit because they try to provide the success stories. Other countries matters because as IPCC, IPBS, also our natural capital or includes various reports summarize, these are more science evidence-based. So those international knowledge promotes how robust it is. And if we make a mistake, we can correct that this is not true. We need to change it. So next step, carbon neutrality come together with those different collaboration and each discipline promote better measure, applying different areas and involve farm activities so that academic contribution to the society will be improved more. And I, I finish by saying that sustainability is a good chance for carbon neutrality and with economy too. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Managi, for this very insightful um, speech of yours. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I learned a lot today, so I, I really love this, um, which is why I would like to open up the um, Q&A session right away. Um, so please post your questions either in the chat room or utilize the raise your hand um, function on the Zoom toolbar to ask your questions directly. Now, I really hope you're not shy because it doesn't really help when the moderator always talks and the moderator has to think about questions. I think it's really important that we all um, are active here. And I already um, received a question, which was, um, which is actually for Mr. Aoyagi. Um, so we have someone asking, thank you for, for the excellent talk. COVID-19 has slowed down SDG progress around the world. If another wave of COVID-19 starts, how should the four action areas you mentioned adapt to it? Can you, yeah, so that's the question I was supposed to ask. Well, uh, thank you for the question. I think that it's really difficult one. Well, the, yes, it's true. The COVID-19 gave us a lot of impact, especially in the for future generations. The many student learners got the learning losses in these two years. And to the recover the learning loss, it's gonna be really, really big challenge for not only the education sector, but uh, government and also the UN sectors. <clears throat> the, to cope with the repeated such kind of pandemic, I think that we have to look at what we, what we did really on the ground and how to cope with and how to collaborate each other at community and national and global level. I don't think that this kind of the pandemic cannot be addressed by one country or the one community. So the information sharing and then the exchange of the practice will be very helpful to address these issues. But I do not hope the such kind of pandemic comes again. Thank you very much. So the question is how other uh, how the climate policy is coordinated with different policy for the SDGs. Thank you for asking questions. So the SDG is the basically the comprehensive agreement, whatever the many different uh, people involved. So for example, you know, since uh, uh, Mr. Arge is there, the education is one goal. And uh, people in the UNESCO education experts think education is basically everywhere. And some people say, oh, education is co always connected, maybe not necessarily to be the one goal, but it's good that uh, I think, you know, it's there. So always some uh, policy have more name there. For example, there are many environmental related goals, such as energy issues, uh, uh, urban planning, also the water and the oceans. But relatively the health is not there. 
So I, I think the next step, uh, global goal after the SDG will be more health, come together with many different uh, development goals. But given that uh, climate actions as a policy, basically change what kind of energy we're gonna use, which is energy related SDG goals. Also that decide next step urban planning, we're gonna create, as I said, for the more uh, forestation, which keep the forestries, also the use of agriculture for the uh, observe, uh, getting additional carbon dioxide emissions, which keep the agricultures. But suppose other industry comes in and uh, create the building that's changed the uh, land use change. So also that matter to the different SDG goals. So policy for the climate is not only for the climate goals of one SDGs, Instead, it interact with a different source because more the water use industry coming, and even though they can reduce emissions, it gets more water usage or even less. So that all, all of the SDGs is interlinked well. So we need to think about different policies, also the different index in the SDG together and saying, and. Uh, those are connected. And the people in the academics, what is requested is uh, what are uh, uh, both coming together well or trade-off exists. And if trade exists, that trade-off is very big or not, quantifying it and telling that and potential problem in the case study, those are becoming more important. Uh, thank you for asking questions. Wonderful, thank you very much. And I'm back again, I don't know what happened. <laughs> so we have another question now for Professor Aoyagi. Um, what is your advice to re reverse the regression on the targets 12 and 13 beyond education? Well, the, it's really, really a pertinent question for us and for us all. I think the most important thing that how we can encourage the mindset change of the mindset and uh, change of behavior, attitude, patterns of the people. The policy at the global and national level can be influenced by the voice of the people. If the people can unite it to one voice, into one voice to do something on climate change, that will be the very big power. But for that, we really need the kind of evidence and scientific data from the research in communities. And that will only the way to create some kind of the, the consensus among the people and the creating the uh, inclusive voice towards the trends we are now facing. Again, I'd like to really, really expect the great contribution from research communities to produce the very specific scientific evidence and the convincing data to create such the uh, consensus and the people's voice. Wonderful, thank you very much. And I think the next question would be for Professor Managi. Um, what is the big industry in Japan that contributes most to carbon emission? And is there any subsidized policy from the government to help the industry and how? So that's in the chat as well. Thank you. Uh, that's electric power industries. As always, many country is similar. So the policy in direct power related to industries in Japan is we have renewables. Mostly, uh, next step will be hydrogen or gasifications. And since we do not produce our energy for the metals much, we import a lot for the coal, gas and uh, other minerals. And those are getting changed to coal to the gas and the oil to the gas. So some renewables comes in. So the policy is subsidized for the more renewables to do it. Then the question is how big that subsidy will increase or not. And in the past 10 years, we have more subsidy to the solar that will be changing to the uh, wind power and others. So the uh, more the electrification comes in, so the source of the electricity uh, come from the renewables. Then 
try to change from the other industry to the more electricity usage, same as gas. And that will be the huge trend for the next step. And the carbon dioxide tax, additional to the emission trading, will be the next step for the uh, five years. So the uh, each industry policy is there, but the more overall comprehensive policy is coming in the next two years. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And we have another question or comment um, in the chat box. So good morning. For developing countries, there are a lot of other more urgent priority areas than being a carbon neutral society or climate change mitigation actions in general, such as poverty reduction, housing, security, and so on. So as professors, do you have examples of projects or programs? And I think this is a good question for also Mr. Aoyagi and um, Professor Managi, but also anyone else um, joining us here, um, if, if they would like to comment on that one as well, they're very welcome. But maybe Mr. Aoyagi, do you want to comment first? Well, the, yes, I understand that uh, in the world, we have a lot of kind of uh, the placing issues like poverty and housing and how we can deal with the daily life. And I think the UNESCO sees that all these the issues and challenges are interconnected and then the addressed by multi-sector approach. For example, the poverty, the cause of poverty is many, not education or the lack of information and skills and knowledge is one of the things to address such poverty. But for that, the policy should be developed in a very the holistic manner, how we can reduce the gap the no one left behind is the very big principle of UN towards the agenda 2030. But as a matter of fact, we've seen still a lot of people behind, far like behind in terms of wealth, in terms of information, access to information, in terms of especially the digitization. The digital, the world is becoming emerging. And then, the, for example, in the case of Thailand, we have a lot of kind of learning losses are there. And we think the digital power is one of the things to the, resolve these questions. The, in remote areas, the, uh, and the poverty, the uh, people do not have enough access to information, to be honest. So the question is how we can deal with this imbalance at the policy level that we have to reduce the gap, but reality is not so easy. So again, the holistic approach towards achievement of 2030 agenda is how we can collectively come up with some consensus on the very principles of agenda 2030 that is no one left behind. Again, it's not easy, but people's will or the voice or a consensus or the pressure to the, the policy makers will be very, very important factor. I understand that in many countries, between the countries and within the countries, still a huge gap in many senses. And they are the only people and power to change the course. So the, I think once again, we have to look at the importance of education training or the awareness raising. Uh, this year, the education community will see a very big turning point that was the uh, Transforming Education Summit, which will be convened by the UN Secretary General in September. There will be the two big themes over there. One, how we can address the learning loss, how we recover the learning losses. And another one is the, how we look at the future of education, the transforming education towards the people. I think the, your involvement again will in this the global discourse and the regional the conversations is really, really important to change the course. We need, again, the evidence, data, but more importantly, the will of the people to change these things. Again, the, I know a lot of issues and challenges on the ground are there on the ground in place, but only one sector cannot change the course. So the international cooperation, collaboration among researchers, academics will be much more important in this coming month towards the uh, Transforming Education Summit and other very big events around climate change. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Aogi. Um, Professor Managi, would you like to comment on this? Um, again, examples of projects or programs to be implemented at a university, for example. Yeah, uh, I gave a uh, specific uh, response in the two way. One is more smaller project. Another is a uh, bigger one country's project. We have been working for uh, Indonesia's project for the uh, electrifications, which is using the solar, para, solar panels uh, to be uh, connected to the, uh, providing the electricity to the local village, where the grid is not connected to the other areas. So the small village, uh, small town support for the electricity. So what is good is the energy come from renewables. Of course, this is good for the climate, right? Then second is we do the survey in the same time, not just providing the infrastructure with industry within Indonesia. Uh, our evidence shows those connection to the grid locally, not to the whole country level, but they make utilize enough time for the housewife or all the people there to have access to the different areas. So the quality of life as a major value increase, will being increased, the time increase, also the carbon neutrality improves. So by connecting to the carbon neutrality, even though poverty and many other issues is more important, we can have win-win situation by case studies. So I think those examples will be improving. So the future project shouldn't make some people become more busy, more investment, no benefit. Instead, uh, more time for additional time, additional activity, uh, more improvement for the well-being. Second project that I have worked and published in the uh, Lancet Planetary Health is India's air pollution. People in the Delhi uh, think about the air pollution is so heavy and problems, and the many environmental experts say this is bad for the health. Health people also say, you know, particular problems comes in. So what is missing is policy doesn't go on. So we chose by providing the negative value to the health as human capitals, we say about 1.5% uh, of the GDP loss because of human loss. Human loss come from the damage to the bodies. Air pollution is not only the environmental issues. By changing the transportation patterns, changing the energy sources, both are good for the carbon neutrality, but essentially good for the people's health, people's economies, because without doing it, every year in India, statistically 1.5 million people die. So by showing those evidence and it becomes the first page of the newspaper in the India, India Times, people in the community as a policymaker start to aware, okay, this is practically important. So even though pollution matters, uh, more economic development matters, but additional change in the policy save people's life and change in the infrastructure is good for the carbon neutrality because the source of the uh, coal has been decreased. Source of the dirty as a energy usage as a lifestyle has been decreased. So always we can think about not causing the trade-off, but we initiations in practice. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. And I would once I'd like to ask um, Ms. Schoenliebe as well for a comment on projects, and then I will hand over to um, Nuni Nuriani, who's raising her hand the whole time. So, <laughs> so first, um, Ms. Schoenliebe, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Konomi. Just a um, really great question. I just wanted to add uh, something about projects and programs and activities. Clearly, there's a, a great interest for engagement. So. Um, if, uh, if uh, whoever is engaged in an APAU member, but also um, students and early career researchers and professors from outside the APAU network are welcome to engage in many of the activities that APAU members um, participate in or also start initiating such as this, this very important activity we are just in at the moment. 
And uh, a lot of those activities are also undertaken with external stakeholders, such as UN ASCAP, such as UN Habitat. We've also been collaborating with UN ASCAP. UNESCO and for example there's one project going on at the moment where we're working specifically with the Thai government on supporting the development of policies in terms of um, AI implementation for poverty alleviation in Thailand for example and these uh, projects are, are, are put on our website on the AP website and is really calling out to everybody's interested and uh, has the uh, capacity and and researchers in the right areas to engage so keep out um, and look out for those uh, announcements. We really would like to encourage a lot of activities and engagement in this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So now, Noni Nuriani was raising her hand the whole time. So I think it's time we <laughs> finally be able to say something. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for IPR. Are you to? Um, uh, help this uh, organize this event and thank you for our esteemed um, keynote speakers for sharing the knowledge today. Um, I'm really interested on the topic of climate justice and global equal equality. Um, I mean, um, talking about develop developed countries, they already achieved their highest standard of living currently because they already have a quick start of emitting carbon emissions since the beginning of industrial revolution. And it would not be fair, I think, to implement the same strict emission limit to countries that have not been industrialized and thoroughly in poor conditions. Um, I just uh, thought that has there been a fair global carbon budget been developed for each country um, like based on hi historical emission, calculating from the beginning of industrial revolution to achieve the current high standard of living? I mean, um, not this should exclude um, emission coming from volcanoes, forests, fires, and things like that. And yeah, and I think even like for countries that have been colonized during the period of the colonization, those um, costs of emission should go to the colonizing country. So that's what I think is, has there been, a, uh, de uh, been developed a fair global carbon budget based on his historical uh, emission for each country? I think that would be fair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to come? Yeah, Professor Managi, please. Thank you. Um, you know what uh, international politics works is, as you said, those historical situations uh, matter a lot. And developing countries, of course, you say that. Also, some of the colleagues in the developed countries understood well. But it doesn't make it clear that because we think about those equity, uh, some particular country who got the burden should have more budget for that. But international community indirectly decide that more than developing country achieve more budget. Initially starting from the uh, share of the, uh, each country's overseas development program ODA, would be uh, more for the green issues. Then internationally, many joint activities encouraged for the carbon reduction, as I said, for the uh, India's case and the Indonesia's case, those focus getting more to uh, the uh, developing countries. And the long run trend for the uh, initiative for the World Bank and other also too. So I think the trend itself is more toward recognizing the uh, global budget for the carbon reduction throughout European countries, although it doesn't state clearly because of that. But as a result, I think that will be coming always. So uh, always the people who think about uh, climate justice may think that's not enough. But when you are thinking about past 25 years after that Kyoto Protocol, uh, I see huge change over the past five, 10 years. So the developing countries, people can expect more to uh, that budget in the next step too. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Unfortunately, we're, we're already running out of time, um, but I would like to 
um, read the last question for today, which is um, to Mr. Aoyagi, because it's a little bit lo local, <laughs> local in the sense of um, related to Thailand and Bangkok. Um, so what will, be, what will be UNESCO activity or initiative in Bangkok relating behave, behavior change of reduced CO2 emission? So Chulalongkorn Kong University has aimed to accelerate carbon neutrality, neutrality activities in university, such as recently activity um, Chula Carbon Neutral Competition. We would like to connect if the UNESCO in Bangkok could collaborate in this matter. So maybe just a little comment from <laughs> Mr. Aoyagi on this one. Well, the, thank you. The Chula is a very important partner for us in many of the subjects. And it, as far as the climate action concerned, we also going towards the green office the, with the renewable energy usage and also the, the how we can reduce the waste and then how we can use the waste as a comp compost. And all the things are the, very much to do with the competition and the, we like to try to apply for the competition. But uh, in addition to that, I'd like to show the one slide which I missed. The, which might be your interest, how the UNESCO and other UN works towards the uh, climate actions. Well, the, we developed such kind of the, the advocacy materials on the climate science literacy. But we concern about the connotation and meaning of language, is it common to everybody? For example, the climate, uh, what is the climate change and how climate change affect us and the climate and education, climate and energy and the climate consumption and production. These are the kind of issues of these posters. We have 27 and then the dealing with the, the terms and the connotations of the, these the subject and words. We think that we have to have common understanding on the particular languages. The previous speaker mentioned about the uh, climate justice. What does it mean? If the people understand the climate the justice and the common understanding, the discussion at global level will be much more easier and then accountable for the, all the people living in this world. And uh, these materials trying to the, uh, promote the common understanding on particular language around climate the, uh, actions. And I think the Chula can be working with us for promoting these materials in schools and the universities to the, uh, encourage the student learners to be on the same page, at least the using the language in the same kind of meanings. So I welcome you that you are come to this the, uh, website, which is on this slide. Then the working together, especially the, this year, we will expand the activities on how to use these materials in the university and schools. And uh, UN, UNEP, UNDP, UNICEF, UNESCO, and other UN agencies are the kind of joint endeavor for this. Uh, initiative, and then we will be ha very happy to work with Chula and other universities and net university networks like the uh, APUM. So this is one of the example, but we have a lot. So the, I welcome your collaboration and participation in our initiatives. Wonderful, thank you so much. We're absolutely over time now. So I will wrap it up here because I know that a lot of you are busy. <laughs> so thank you once again to our wonderful <laughs> keynote speakers today. And thank you to the wonderful audience in this part of the session today um, for being so active and enthusiastic with the many questions. Um, so I would like to ask for a round of applause. Maybe you can use your, your reaction buttons or you can just really turn on your cameras and clap in your hands. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. This was wonderful.